Hello everybody. We hung on a bit because it's a bit of a long way to trek to get out here when people first arrive. And uh, one of our speakers, John, has had a problem getting in. So uh, John Thompson Barclays, unfortunately, won't be here today. Not, of course, that we haven't got two fantastic participants, as, w as you can see, anyway. Can you... I'm, pr I'm very conscious here I'm stuck in the middle. C you probably can't see them there, can you? Can you, can you see everybody all right? Do you want to move around a bit, then you... So I just sit right in the centre, is that fair? If, if you feel you want to do that. <laughs> um. Yes, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> Editorially, workspaces have been a bit of a nightmare to write about because um, <coughs> our dilemma has been how do you define one, how do you work what's needed with what's needed and almost everybody we interview has a different opinion about what should constitute a workspace of any kind right across the, the divide of companies we talk to. We spent a year and a half going into this and the GPA, when we leave here, we're going over to the GPA who are, are coming out with a workplace study from um, from Holland, actually, and uh, they're, they're coming up with a bit of thinking. And it was supposed to be with John Thompson at Barclays, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still a new bit of thinking on virtually everything we have. There are lots of definitions of, of different types of space, but it's a question of how you think strategically about the kind of space you need and how you populate it with technology, which is always a very difficult thing to come down to and depends on so many factors. But we have with us today, um, two of my colleagues who I know quite well, who've done a variety of approaches to this. And one thing I hope we do with um, Avia Magazine's approach is come up with some sort of practical approach to how we, how we address what are becoming quite complex issues uh, of technology implementation and just general approaches to what people euphemistically call an experience these days, which I'm not entirely sure what it is. Anyway, if I'll introduce you one by one. To my glorious left, uh, I have Matt Anders, who's head of global media services at eBay. Yep. And to his left, I've got Ahan Behich, Be who is uh, audiovisual manager at Deliveroo. And I have to, I have to say, um, we, we've, been, we've looked at you know, e e eBay, Deliveroo, uh, Bloomberg, we just just finished looking at Facebook, and it probably is no coincidence that the uh, the new type of high tech social media type of company, or, or those who are exploiting the modern technologies, are those who are perhaps having the in most interesting perception of workplaces in the environment. So we've got two of them here who've done some amazing stuff, really, on the whole. So I thought it'd be quite nice to get them on the on the on the panel and just to just hear what they've been doing. Um, right, Matt. Yes. Do you want to just start by probably giving us an overview of what you've been doing so many things, haven't you, at, at eBay? And it's difficult to keep up with what you have been doing. Do you think of the word workspace? Or has it just been... You've had so many um, technology rollouts in the past year or two. I've sort of lost track. Yeah. Have you ever used the word workplace? Or have, have, have implementations and and views of how people are using various office areas been hijacked by the people who call the workspaces? Or, I mean, how, what's, your, what's your approach to What's your opinion about it? Yeah, I mean, obviously we work closely with our workplace resources team, WPR. That's what they're called. That's what they are called. That's sort of name uh, of it, it? Obviously it's called facilities over here, but in the US it's called WPR. So we work, the, work them closely and our space planning team. Um, as you know, since we last met over the last few years, we've we pretty much, I used to look after Europe, I'm based in Austin, Texas now. Um, we do have a global standard that we've rolled out. Uh, we have changed stuff over the last few years, but we've been pretty stable for two years now. All uh, We upgraded 14 video conference rooms a week. Are you ever stable? Uh, I'm very stable now. <laughs> I didn't even go out last That's night. That's very confident to say, sir. Um, so yeah, we're basically, we're working very close to our workplace and, and space planning team. We're working uh, to, Obviously, we, we look at our rooms, and when I joined eBay, I've been there 11 years. So when I joined, obviously, we, we were building a lot bigger spaces, 12 to 14-person, 16-person rooms. Uh, we just opened uh, an office in Madrid last uh, couple of weeks ago. 
we just expand an office in Salt Lake. And these rooms, these offices now are much more focused on two to four person rooms. Uh, we've redesigned a whole video conference and AV standards based around that. What, why is it focused on two to four person rooms? What got you to that thought? We did, so Workplace Resource and the Space Planning team do more of the planning than us. Um, they did very basic surveys where literally people are walking around the office and they're walking around with a pen and paper and they're noting people who are in the rooms. What we used to call time and motion studies. That, that, that's that's, that's past something. my time, I wouldn't know, Clive. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so used to walk around with a paper. Now, obviously, our rooms are, are much more intelligent. Every single VC room we deploy in the last three years have sensors in, so we know we're in their use. At the moment, those sensors are only telling us if they're in use or not. Um, so we can see how busy our rooms are. Uh, we've been working with two companies uh, in the last six months. Where we're actually working to design heat sensors with them, which are actually coming into our new standards, version two of our standards. So I'm here this year actually to look at a lot of uh, different sensors and USB cameras and mics. These new sensors we're looking at are actually going to tell us how many people are in these rooms. And then actually we can actually link it into our cloud system. So we can actually say if you've booked a 16 person room and there's only four of you in that room, we can contact you afterwards and say, why are you booking this room? So we're trying to utilize our space as much and be much more intelligent about it than we used to be. So you can, based on the analysis of how people use those rooms, you can probably identify a need for a different type of room. Indeed. And then for their full start. Is that roughly how it works? Or yes, the is idea that, is, is we're a trying higher, to... higher loftier thinking than that? I mean, spaces are obviously very expensive. So we're trying to find out, you know, we're trying to use more of our spaces by working out how, how, how they're actually used by the business. And we're slowly, in the last few years, starting to work that out much better now. Hey, Han, you've done so much at delivery, haven't you? Yeah. yeah, we're lucky to have you here, aren't we? You just about made it by the skin of your teeth, really. Yeah, just about. Got off the so plane just under an hour ago. <laughs> so so you, well, we covered you as a story, didn't we? But just to explain briefly what you've been up to, and where you are now, and what you're, what you're planning ahead. Yeah, so the, um, I've only been at delivery, let's say, it's almost been a year now. But in delivery years, that's 30 years <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the company. 10 years in Navy <laughs> years. Oh, oh, honestly, we're moving, s <coughs> we're moving so, so quickly. It's hard to keep up with the pace sometimes. But just a bit of a backstory. When I, um, when I started in March last year, I walked into an office um, and I walked into one of the AV rooms. And honestly, it was, it was falling apart. There was cables everywhere. There was a random clear one microphone on the ceiling connected to a pole. And that, and that was that was their standard at the time. My job, uh, what I was tasked with, was to create our new office space, which which you've seen, and we had to get that built in July. We had to have bums on seats in July. So my probation period was basically to get this office right. So immense immense pressure on well, me there. What was the thinking behind how the office should look? So <laughs> it, the thinking behind it wasn't in terms of what AV solution are we going with? It was it was about the workspace. That that was that was critical. Um, the need for an open space and huddle areas w w was essential. Just because we we were we were at the time in an office. I think we had just over three hundred members of staff in this one office that was only meant to have maybe just just above two hundred people. So we, we yeah we we were imploding at the time. Um, you to to have I mean I saw situations where there was colleagues outside in the corridor, having meetings next to the loose with a phone or loudspeaker. Um, that's 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 how dire the situation was at the time. We we but we so moving from there we went from it was I believe six meeting rooms at the time, to one phone booth for privacy, to twenty three meeting rooms with a dozen phone booth spaces plus various other. Huddle, huddle, huddle spaces that you 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 weren't able able to book on the calendar, so that was just for pure ad hoc meetings. But what 23 dedicated rooms now. So what did you decide? What do you decide that should go in these in rooms, and how do you how do you design? I mean, it's difficult. I mean, people mention huddle rooms all the time. What actually goes in into the rooms? You. So the decision behind that it was um, it was quite a funny one actually because we were deciding at the time whether we were going to go three six office three six five or whether it was going to be a Google house. This is how young the company is. We, we were still deciding on these sort of matters. Um, and we managed to just catch a very senior member of staff one day in the corridor and say, do you have five minutes to discuss this? And the decision was made literally in that five minute meeting to say, well, and the decision was, I like Google. So that's what we're going with. So we based our whole solution around that. 
Um, and as a standard now, we are using uh, Google Meet, previously Google Hangouts, and that is a standard we have throughout all our, our meeting rooms. I mean, did you just chop the space up into smaller offices because you had to get people into some space, or was there was something more going on than that? I mean, the thing about Google, funnily enough, we had Gary Keane in a while, and uh, the thing about Google is they're constantly experimenting. They have a fluid environment where they, they change the space within their office environment all the time to accommodate how people are working. So it's, um, it's, it's quite unusual to see that in a company because not, not, people, not many people are geared up to work in that way. I mean, it's really backfired with Apple in the States where they've created this huge donut thing. And of course, their top creators have all rebelled to say they're not working in open space. They want their small space back. And it, it, it's not been made public really yet, but it's really not worked at all. And it can be quite a precarious thing to do when you're thinking about a new space. So, you know, when, you, when you're faced, when you have to sort of move, pe- move people in quite quickly into a functional area. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, actually, because we went, we, imagine we went from an office with, si- with six meeting rooms, very, very tiny space, very, uh, very cosy, let's say, to a 50,000 plus square foot office. So people adjusted very quickly, actually. So we, we was all hands on deck on the first week to, you know, to help people out with the AV in the rooms. And how, do they, how do they behave when they're in that environment? Do they behave differently? Or were they more, more, more productive or did they just seem happier? They do seem happier. I do, have, I do hear the general moans and groans, that, oh, I've missed the old <laughs> ways in the old office, but you, you're going to get that. As the company changes, of course, the environment changes, um, the way we think of AV changes. But luckily, it's, it's taken off pretty, pretty well. I didn't have to actually pretty much assist anyone that, that first week because everyone was, was, was uh, willing to do it themselves. I mean, it's a bit like chicken and egg, isn't it? It's very difficult to know what's driving this, really, whether the technology we're using now is sufficiently uh, modern and sophisticated to actually be able to use in a way that's more flexible. And, of course, office space is so expensive that people are using, are thinking more, more differently, differently about how to repurpose the space they bought. So it's, it's very difficult to know what's driving this, really, whether they want to get... Of course, they're also looking at how to get more of their workforce especially big pharmaceutical companies who wanted to work, you know, put more creative people together that wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be working together, so they get that spark to create new products, new drugs, and so on. And th- th- these big new developments are, have got quite a bit of psychology behind them in the, in the top environments, but we cover such a wide area, it's very difficult to know what's driving what. Uh, and that, you know, it's, it's usually quite practical, isn't it? You know, you've got to, you have a very immediate consideration, I suppose, and you, you try and you try and lump it with it and you get on with it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah. I think some of the, yeah. when you say driving, I think basically it's coming from a lot of what you can do at home. That's our main struggle for us. We're a technology company. Uh, you know, you can walk in, you can be at home. And when I get, for instance, my apartment at home, uh, I can walk in and before I get in, all my lights are set up, my temperature's set up, and basically everything just turns on. I've, I've used all these apps, so it's all mobile for me. So, you know, if you can do that at home, why can't we do this in the office? So we have people, you know, want Apple TVs or they want Google Chromecast and stuff like that. So what's we're trying to, we're actually building an app in house right now with our own developers. Um, that basically where we're going to try and bring everything into one app. So when you do get close to a meeting room, it, it can know you're there using sensors and it can start your meeting. Uh, we're looking at, you know, voice activation. So you know, just say, you know, join my VMR and you say your VMR and it actually starts your VMR. So we're, st- we're looking at the consumer market seems to be driving it, and that's what people want in, in more of the corporate space. Sorry, Matt, could I ask you a question? Um, when people don't turn up to meetings, what's your technology at the minute? For what's what, sorry? If people don't turn up to their meetings, um, that's a big problem we have at Deliveroo. What's, yeah, what's so the protocol at eBay? So we're testing out now. We've got room booking panels outside every room. Um, so we're testing out a new code now that basically links in diref- directly to Office 365. So when you come into your room, you basically have to click, you click OK, and if it doesn't, if you don't click OK within 15 minutes, it deletes it from the cloud and the meeting room's freed up. Yeah, that's the same, that's the same yeah. delivery. But generally, I think we did a study on it last year. Uh, I think th- there's loads of studies out there. I think something crazy, like 60% of people don't turn up to meetings or something yeah. ridiculous. So we're trying to do that. And then at the moment, we did have sensors in the room, IR sensors, that deleted your meeting. But the problem is if people didn't move, they started deleting meetings. Yeah, I've had a situation so that's what we're moving where to, uh, yeah, the heat lights sensors. have switched off quite a few, a yeah. few times in our room. So we found heat yeah. sensors, uh, you don't have that problem. But the heat, the corporate heat sensor at the moment, there's one, I, I can't remember what the brand, there's one here, but it's, it's, it's big. So you won't have the problem with that, so that's what we're looking at. 
The only problem with heat sentences is someone's hijacked the room that they're not meant to be in. I'm, I'm guessing the sensor would... They'd still would yes, they'd still start that meeting from the outside. Oh, they'll still have in, to check in. Right. But then if they leave the meeting, we can free it up early. Yeah. We can, but also we're doing stats. So if it's two people in a 16-person room, we can contact you and ask you why you booked it. So then you stop, because everyone just books any room that's closest to them. Or maybe it's got a nice view of the ocean or, yeah. <laughs> or sea, even. There are a lot of humour factors on there. Where do, where do user requirements come into all this? I mean, you know, you can, you can see what the company can probably see what it needs to do. But how much interaction is, is there with the people who are actually using the room and the technology within it? Yeah, we, we have a council. We have a uh, council that meets month, month. It's an independent council for the, off, uh, for the CIO. It's called the OCIO Council. They meet with uh, key business partners once a quarter. And uh, I always look forward to those emails. <laughs> But yeah, they, uh, they provide their feedback, which isn't always the best feedback. Well, do yeah. you learn from it or do you... Uh, um, uh, how much, yeah. I had one the other day, actually, but yeah, it's a different story, but yeah. Well, um, I've got the same thing, you know, I, I nearly met a reader once, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's always every editor's... Do you think you're, you're providing content for, for a reader you know they're going to want to read it until they actually, you actually meet them and say, well, I didn't like that, or why do you do that? And you, you, you sort of avoid them in the streets some, sometimes, thinking, well, of course I know what they want, and they're going to jolly well have it, you know. And it's the same sort of thing in these workspaces, isn't it, really, where you think you, you've got it right and then someone somewhere just says the obvious you've just missed. Yeah. And they think, God, he's right, you know. Yeah, we think it's quite easy. Like, obviously, generally, everyone in our, in our team thinks our standards are, are, are really great. You can start a meeting within five seconds. And we're trying to improve that. Um, but, yeah, when you go to the business unit, obviously, they don't find it as easy. So um, we do look at them like people who aren't as technical, and obviously take their advice. The problem with, with us as well, we change products every, for our, yeah, we used to change different products to join a VC every every year or two years. You're using Polycom, then you're using Adobe Connect, then you're using Skype for Business, then you're using Slack, and now you've got Teams coming out. So there's all these products coming out. So we're just trying to, you know, narrow down how many products we offer the business. Thank you for leading on to the next question. It's how do you decide what's, what's I mean, are we, are we getting a lot of DI, I mean, John, who's not here, sadly, he's been working with a lot of DIY type of products that are simple. And very flexible at Barclays, and uh, he was just saying that you know they want these easier to use, flexible products, standardised, so you can just have that have that option should he yeah. need it. And he's really stri- these r- his workspace is right down to the minimum, so any additional functionality you bring with you and log and log into the basic core of what he's provided. Well, I can see his point, but not everybody <laughs> does, of course. You know, DIY products at a bank sounds yeah. uh, a, bar- uh, a Barclays more importantly. Yeah. Maybe moving my. Uh, Move my account. I know. <laughs> it's, it's been said. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the, the choice of, um, of technology to populate these spaces is not easy, is it? You know, it's, um, I just wonder whether the whole market's geared up to, to, to really accommodate what is a rapidly changing landscape for users. You know, they're demanding this, that, and the other. And look at how social media and, and the home use of, of, uh, of technology has changed higher education. That, you know, now they're pumping money into higher education. The, the universities are having to provide what their customers, the students, want. And they've got a huge dilemma on their hands between providing what they usually do, which is networking and IT, into a completely different environment, which is driven by social media. So it's, it's very difficult to sort of predict ahead just quite what a, a newly emerging type of employee, staffer, just sort of person you want to bring on board with new ideas and creativity. And you want to enable them as as well as you can in a very different working environment. So you've got two dilemmas, haven't you? You've got a completely different rethink about technology you're using and the context in which that to- technology is being used. Yeah. In a way, it's, it's quite fast changing. I don't know how you, you think about how you approach that, really. I mean, we're, 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 so our aim is to move to more of a cloud solution. That's our CIO strategy across the board. That's like well-known. So basically, we're moving. We moved fully to Skype for Business in the cloud. We've moved Office 365 in the cloud. We've moved our signage to the cloud. We've moved our webcast TV to the cloud. So that's all the products that I own, most of the products I own. And uh, you know, our next one at the moment, we're, we're still an on-prem infrastructure for our video conferencing. So we were very, very much on track to move to a Skype for Business. Uh, you know, opens up your standards a bit to what you can use in your rooms. And then obviously, Microsoft came and announced Teams. And that basically put a halt to everything. Then we had people who wanted to use Teams. We've got people who love Slack still. Uh, we've got people who like Zoom, Starleaf, all this stuff. So we're actually in a phase at the moment where we're actually looking to choose one of those cloud products. Um, for us, that, that is a bit of a nightmare. But for us, with the standards, um, 
before we were, you know, we were locked into say Polycom, which uses which uses bespoke connections to the codec. So one of the things why I'm here is like looking at actually let's start looking more at USB cameras, USB mics, uh, open source touch panels, not necessarily crashed on AMX. You know, there's panels out there that you can use for Android, you can use for Windows. Because then if we go, you know, the Polycom route, or we went, you know, say a Cisco route, or a Zoom route, or a Starleaf route, for us, our rooms then actually we can just switch that over quite easily. Right now we just rolled out 16 rooms a week. We upgraded 600 VC rooms to Polycom on new standards, but that's obviously locked in. Um, you can point the codex to other stuff, but we're looking more now at, you know, what what source, what program can we use that's going to work in our rooms in the future? And obviously at the moment USB 3, I think. There's a new like, Huddly camera that's come out. There's, you know, Logitech have got quite a few, so we're going to be looking at that quite in depth, because then our solution down the future can change without having to upgrade, you know, two, three thousand rooms. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, coming to ISC, for example, it's probably the way we are now in terms of timing. It's probably, probably good, actually, to make yourself a short list and actually see what this technology does and have a look at it and give the sales guys a bloody good grilling and, uh, you know, don't accept the status quo in here. Just really sort of think hard, really long and hard about what you need and get them to convince you what they're selling can do it because it's so often missed, they'll, they'll, you know. But we see how collaboration's gone. Now we've got experience, we've got all these lovely words that really mean nothing until you actually see what the technology can actually do and where you are focused in your business to actually integrate it effectively. And that depends what you've got installed already, of course. Um, did you have an awful lot of legacy? I, I haven't asked you this, but did you have an awful lot of legacy kit that you had to accommodate when you were, when you were going through all this change? I am. Each monitor at our office had, if I remember, a Mac Mini, Apple TV, a HDMI connection for your machine, and a random wireless keyboard and mouse that ran out of battery all the time. <laughs> so not too bad. So, so starting a meeting previously, you would walk in, You'd try and find a remote, always went missing. Get on the right source channel. Then you are asked for a login details on the Mac Mini, um, which I always getting slacked about what's the password. They entered the password, then they had to open up a Chrome browser, which needed updating. Mac was asking for, <laughs> for a software update. So, you know, that took a, a good 10 minutes to, to start a meeting. The technology wasn't the main driver behind how, you know, the user was going to present it. that you know all they all they wanted to know these millennials they just wanted to walk in a room and have it as easy as possible they wanted an experience that was like they were at home on their phone they wanted to walk in a um, couple clicks of a button and into a VC call off we go um, how we are now we, we w you, w you literally do press two buttons now so you walk in you check in on the tablet outside you pick up the remote your meeting should be on there if you booked it on the calendar which which would have done and um, and you're in a VC call. Who was driving this in delivery? I mean, there was a CIO involved, or was a was it? I mean, wha so what it sort of level was this thought at? It was a combination of myself, uh, the director of IT, and also the our CTO. So it went. It it did it did go, it did go quite to a high level. And it was our CTO actually that um, that preferred we be a Google house. Um, I'm happy we did go down that route because it, it works very well with our calendar. Um, that, that was the main driver, actually. What works best with our calendar? So previously, we used Zoom. Um, in that case, EAs were booking meetings and I would have to copy and paste the code each time, uh, which, which I was never a fan of because user error, you, you, you know, you miss a code. Um, and, 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 and it happened quite a few occasions and you'd have to call up the EAO you didn't book this meeting in this time but now it's, as soon as you book that meeting into our calendar it's immediately booked into that room I mean it's not insignificant I mean you probably had lots of legacy kit did you I thought that you heard it before before you started all this process it was obviously a, a long process but you had prob presumably the traditional IT and, and just traditional AV in there it must have taken quite a bit of you had the vision to sort of think about changing all this was it the w that split off and what the company wanted to do in its new form? Or? Yeah, I mean, uh, when, obviously when I joined 11 years ago, I used to look after IT for London. Yeah, um, made dramatic changes and really, wasn't about the response. I mean, yeah, there wasn't an AV team, didn't exist. No. And then we did our own thing. We had a project go around Europe and we just upgraded randomly to life size and everything was different. 
different screens, different switches, different cables. So we created a stand in Europe first, then we created my, my previous manager created an AV team in um, in the US. We still had different standards, and then he moved on, and then we basically created a global standard probably about, it was only about three years ago when we started creating an actual global standard that we, uh, that ev so every single room now is identical. Even the cables that are installed by different AV vendors, which they got a bit funny about. They don't like, everyone likes to cable their rooms a certain way or label it. Um, so if you have a cable that's label one in America, label one in the UK is exactly the same. So all our engineers follow the exact diagrams that we give them. So every room is identical. So if we replace an AV vendor, we can just give them the new drawings and everything's exactly the same. So we used to, it started off just being the same codec, the same screen, then it was the same cables, same cable layering. Now everything's literally exactly the same. I mean, I always, always thought that, you know, you, you, you're having different rooms with different uses. Therefore, you know, you, you're going to be thinking about different technologies to that do the best for that use in that particular room. Is that the case or or not? Or are, are you able to really standardize properly across? But, you know, there's not much interoperability between AV products, really. It's, it, it, it's going to have to get there better than it is at the moment, isn't it? Therefore, you know, getting one product environment or a ecosystem, as we now tend to ungraciously call it, to communicate with another one is, is uh, quite difficult. I mean, you had some problems reviewing products in the past, haven't you, where one thing was promised by the vendor and didn't deliver. <laughs> and you're not, knowing how you're not a man to cross in that department, you gave them a good spanking, didn't you? And it was very difficult to actually know what product will do, what it's, it's, what it's, what it's sold to be doing. Yeah, we set up, uh, so we, we, do have, we have a huddle room standard, which is pretty the same. It's, it's still dual screen. So dual screen, every room is dual screen, um, no matter what size it is. We, d we do reduce the cost. Our larger rooms are still pretty expensive. They're still about $30,000 for a large VC room. We can get down to about 16000 for a small huddle room. We're looking to reduce that even more now with our open standards. Um, but yeah, like one of the big things for us as well is Dev Labs. We have a development lab in Scottsdale. We have one in Austin. Now I'm based there. And we have one in London. So now we just get them to ship us the products where we test it in-house and find out what it does and doesn't do. Because like you said, I, I had many arguments of broken promises. My most frustrating aspect of being an editor of a magazine where I can't review product. Many years I, I, I did have labs and we did review products, but it's very difficult to test day because there's no level playing field. And you have to, it's almost like going back to, well, 30, 40 years ago, you went to the mainframe environments. So you had to see the application working in situ to see what the, what the niggles were and how you went around. We're almost going back to that sort of approach, really. And we, there's definitely a market for that, isn't there, in a sense? in-house trialing of there are there are some some houses aren't there but it's everybody promises what what doesn't usually get delivered i mean interesting this big bloomberg thing we're in it's everything's been bespoke they spend a lot of money on it but it developed the products as well because they one of their major beasts was nothing actually performs out of the box as it's supposed to and that's getting quite a big common problem in av um it's quite worrying um i suppose because Technology is getting quite commoditized. It's becoming all singing and dancing, yet not delivering what, what's promised, which is a bit worrying. And as, we, as it proliferates, I just wonder how we're going to cope with that. And you've got that ideal approach. Ahan. Sorry, Matt. So those dev labs, are they bookable by the end users? No, no, no. It's just, uh, for, we have a, a deployment team based in Scottsdale, one in London, and then in Austin. So yeah, it's just, it's just our own private rooms. So we just get all the kit in and just hook everything up and just play around with it. And then the end decision is made by a combination of people, or uh, do, do, do staff have a say in? The end decision of the standards would be made by myself. So we'd have a deployment guy to test it out, they, and then he'd present it to us, and then we would choose that standard. In terms of the overall product that we go with at the moment, the cloud product that we're looking at, that's going right up to the CIO. So he's involved in that. Interesting. How, how is corporate strategy driving this? Uh, obviously, we it's interesting, most work seems to be done by fast-moving companies, usually not longer than, not older than, apart from Apple, of course, than a few, you know, in, in, in the grand plan of life, not that old, not legacy type of age. Are they, are they doing this because they can, do, they can do with technology or they're thinking differently or they're trying to get their staff to work differently and therefore see they need to install different working environments? I mean, what would you say is, is driving all this, really? For us, well, the driving factor for us is to move to more of a cloud strategy. So we wanna, we've, we've shut down, I can't remember, it was over 300 servers in the last like six months or something like that, like crazy. So we basically shut down all those servers. Uh, we're moving fully to cloud. So that's a main reason to move the video. Right now we've got 
like four RMXs in Denver, we've got some in you know, Shanghai, we've got some in Dublin, that just has our video infrastructure. So we can basically, and obviously everything, if you're based in Israel, we have problems now, because when you come, if you have a video conference call, you have to come through the RPAD, which is based in Denver, which loops you back around, then you come through the network, <laughs> bounce around to like Dublin, and obviously then you, have, you can have bad quality. So obviously based on the cloud structure, you go up to the closest server, it's gonna, and, then you trans and then you go on their backbone. That's the main thing is to improve quality. Um, that's, yeah, that's pretty much our main driver. Then in terms of the room standards, yeah, again, going back to the consumer thing, people want to be, people like these days, like you see the kids, everyone's on FaceTime, everyone video conference. I think we have 180,000 video conferences a month, and that's increasing by about 10 or 12% a month, something like that. So more and more people are using video. So we're trying to basically, we want, so we used to do, we used to do 50, one VC room to every 50 users. Now that's 25. Now it's every room. So we open a new office. Every room is video conference enabled. So we're just trying to get more and more people. And you have your, your meetings are more productive. I mean, when I have video conference meetings, I tend to put a shirt on rather than sit there in my pants. So, you know, rather than audio call. You know, I did that many years ago with a German company. It was we nameless, and they were they were. That was American pants, by the way. Now no. I live in America, not English <laughs> pants. <laughs> no, they 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 were. They were communicating with their office in Los Angeles, and they were in short. They had to completely change their dress before they go on with the video conference. They yeah. insist they put a suit on, and it's been coming on a few years since then. But it, it's it's psychological than culturally. So technology now is is infinitely more flexible cost wise, and you can do more with it. Yeah, that in itself is is a basic driver anyway. To you rethinking actually for the first time in many years, just quite how we use technology in the first place. That's been your primary right. Just uh, that leads to different ways of using workspace and technology in general. Yeah, I mean our aim, which obviously doesn't exist today, our aim is to have a very, very high-end 4K, 5K screen in the room, and then you obviously have your mobile, and that's it. So you walk into the room, your mobile base. You walk in the room, your mobile phone knows you're there, which we can do today with Bluetooth beacons. You can do that in shops, like when you walk into a shop, it can say, say you're nearby. A lot of shops actually do that. Um, so yeah, you, you obviously know it's so you're nearby, you have everything in your phone, and you basically your phone knows you're in the room, it just says go, you push go, and then your screen just starts. That's, we built that actually in-house with our own developers. We built a very, it was a hacker form, we built a small meeting room, literally about this big, and when you came up with your mobile phone, it knew you were there, it started the meeting, and they had this little robot that made you a coffee, and all the VCs started up, and actually joined a Polycom video conference call. So it did, it did actually physically work, and that was all built in-house. Um, so that's our, our aim is to get there. But I mean, that's, you know, that's what we're starting. Start off with open source cameras, mics, and stuff like that, then move later down the line when that technology comes around, we'll be able to move to it much easier. Clever way of doing it. It's psychology a good help when you're in the, mid the middle of all this to get your users to use stuff almost invisibly. So you're not pressing any buttons. That's the future help to just walk in and... <laughs> yeah, just walk in, say start. That's <laughs> what so I do when I get home. Yeah. I walk in and say movie time, my whole entire house just adjusts, the temperature goes down, the lights adjust, the screen turns on and just I've linked up with uh, like the IFTTT app and, if you, and it basically just does everything for you. Does your food get cooked or? Well, that's, what my, uh, that's what my fiance is for. We've got delivery for that. <laughs> <laughs> you can hit him later. Delivery, yeah. Um, AI, is that going to be the base of all this as we go on? I mean, a lot of guff's been spoken about AI, hasn't it really? Total rubbish when you think about it. But actually at an IoT, very pretty basic infrastructure level. Um, I mean, uh, you can see the potential of it, can't you, for perhaps thinking intelligently infrastructure level, quite what goes on and on and replacing some of the basic functions in something like a meeting room set that you've got, for example. Have you thought of that? I think people are like starting to look into like Alexia, aren't they, and Siri and stuff like that. Some of the products are linking into that. Um, I think Zoom was doing something on that as well. But yeah, I mean, I think that's going to come in more. I think Harman have their product, don't they, with the uh, with the the clock now that just, just does everything and sort of links into that. I think we'll probably start to see more and more than that as people, you know, like even my age group, obviously we didn't used to use video calls as much, now we're using more video. I think the young, younger people obviously coming in now using more, like I see people now, I, I still text. I see a lot of people that don't even text anymore, they just talk to their phone and it does everything for them. So I think more and more people are gonna wanna come into a room and just start that meeting and not even touch anything. So I think that's what will probably, yeah, be coming up fairly soon. Is the office boundary changing? I mean, I mean, you know, in a way, you, you are trying to find new new boundaries where the office is within a bigger environment, or, or you're going to be faced with a massive like Bloomberg, where there are no walls and no environment. It's a bit like on Barco, you know, um, 
there's no environment, you just a more intelligent use of the space within it with sound, acoustics and various other things that allow you just to simply not think about what you're doing, just in a space you feel that's appropriate. Is, is that going to work just in a, f a few areas? I mean, I don't, you know, it's very difficult when you move from a structured environment to a non-structured one and then you create another structure within it in a different way perhaps, you know, you're putting small rooms in bigger spaces and then you create bigger spaces where there's no structure almost and it just depends on how you use that space. It's like any 8 from 10, take away the number you first thought of, isn't it, really? It's uh, <laughs> very difficult to actually think sensibly about what your plan would be strategically about how to develop it. If I was doing a five-year work, workspace plan, I'm not entirely five sure. Year, how, well, you know, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How I would go about it, how I would think about how is my office space going to change in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, we have dropped, like, just like, I mean, we, we obviously created uh, the open plan sort of office in... San Jose many, many, many years ago. Um, so yeah, now we obviously do see in the office, we have these little booths that are just basically like, I don't know if you've been to the Google office, but they, they have the same thing. They just pop up in the middle of the office and you can just walk in there and have that. So we're seeing more and more of these pop-up spaces. Um, and like I said, we're seeing more and more smaller media. We still have, the lo we still have you know, one or two large rooms. So it's mainly, mainly much, much smaller. Um, and being much more flexible. There's been a lot of debate over the last six months to a year about working from home. Should you work from home? You know, is it better? Is it worse? You know, like the open office space, is that, is that improved stuff? Or is it not improved stuff? I think there's an article recently, a few months ago on that as well. Um, but all our new offices have still built the same. They're all open plan, pop-up rooms, small meeting rooms, and just been able to video conference or present from basically wherever you are. Um, I can't see that changing from our side. It's interesting, I mean, Google encourages you to work from anywhere you like, but it still likes people in the office, doesn't it? It's a bit of a contrasting yeah. approach to what it does. You never quite tell, can't you? Yeah, it's Everybody the same. Says they can, it's, the sa it's the same at Deliveroo. We, we, we do encourage a lot of our staff to, to work from home. Um, and that was the main, main driver behind the AV technology, actually, is they, they need flexibility. They want to know if they were feeling poorly that day, they could still make the 11 a.m. board meeting with, 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 their, with their manager. Um, it's interesting, our, so our town hall talking about open space, um, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's, it's actually based on a basketball court. So the centre of our office is, is a basketball court. Thankfully, they didn't put any uh, nets up near our very expensive screens. Um, but that is truly open space. So we did our best to contain the audio. So we've got like an audio bubble within there. But there are people working at their desks, you know, just three or four metres away from where we have our... Um, our monthly firm whites. So the transparency we have in our in our company is is, is, is excellent. Um, any big important meetings it is in the open space um, for 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 pretty much anyone to listen in, and they can drop in and drop in out as they please. And they they'll sit on. Um, we have like bleachers as well that go up. Thank God for the catch box. I've got to use it in a minute. Actually, yeah. uh, is is that just um, depends on the, on the on the open mindedness and the nature of the employee? I mean, you can't. I mean, it's just going to sound terrible. Are you talking about a different age group of staff that, with experience, may not want to do that? Uh, I always wonder how much, you know, how, how you get different age group. Whether people don't like to talk about this, I know, but you know, I don't want to be um, particularly lying in a sofa and this, that, and the other. When I want to think and do something, I'd like, to, I'd like a slightly more formal. As you can probably tell, I need to rest on something when I'm doing some work. I look like an exploding mattress when I'm actually lying down, like reclining Roman, you know. <laughs> Um, but it's um, it, not everybody wants to do that. They can they'd huddle, huddle up and get a portable out and do it on the floor. I mean, it, does it work having different styles of work in, in, in various spaces like that when people want to work the way they, they want to? Uh, does that work or do people like to work with other people who work like they do? I, I, I suspect that's what, that's what happened at Apple where like-minded people wanted to be on their own and they didn't want to be put into a much more um, open environment where they had to make contact with others yeah being a tech company we obviously have um, we have many engineers in, in you know in house um, and a lot of engineers I don't know if it's the same with eBay but they do they do like to tend to to work alone so is it Apple that are now moving towards keep giving their engineers an office each they're probably having to yeah yeah, so I don't. I'm not the latest yet, but anyway. Yeah, we're doing. It's ironic that Johnny Ive, who is the, the genius behind it, is now head of workspace development. You thought, 
uh, one of the best people in the company would have got that one right. So they must, you ask yourself, what research did they do with their employees? You know, what do they ask them? What, how, what, how, how much information did they have on, on how they wanted to work to, to maintain their productivity and their ideas flowing? Yeah, sp- especially with, with, with engineers when they're coding, they need, to, they need to almost be in the zone, right? Um, so we have an unwritten rule at delivery where if you've got your headphones on, that means um, do not disturb. So even though we have, th- have an open space, if you see someone with their headphones on, uh, do not approach them, basically. So that, that's, that's a good unwritten rule, because if someone just needs to get away and there isn't a phone booth available and they want to be at their desk, um, they pop their headphones on and, 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 and off they go. Would they be more productive in an office environment to themselves? We don't know. That's, that's something we have to, I think, look into. A lot more to this, isn't there? Yeah. I was going to say one last thing. Um, security, when you've got an open and flexible working yeah. environment and it's, you supposedly have no boundaries, how the hell do you deal with security? Is it straightforward? Is it, is it, is it simple security to go for? How do, how do you... I mean, in the old days, we just made the person responsible for their own security rather than the infrastructure they were operating within. And they were the holder of their own security. And that seemed to work pretty well. Because they signed a personal contract with the company to keep their system secure. Yeah, I mean, in terms of security, in terms of walking around the office, seeing people's screens, I don't, yeah, we, we don't really, yeah, that doesn't really come into play, I don't think, for us. Um, I would say in terms of product security, that's huge for us. We, w- we, will not, we will not buy any products now that don't have 802 cert on it, or we won't buy any stuff that has holes. We, we have our own red team that just basically goes into every single product we have, um, and they try and hack into it. Obviously, there was, you know, there's been breaches on certain companies. For us, it's huge. If eBay gets breached, it's massive. So in terms of security products, literally we, we chat to people, no 802 cert, we don't even look at those products anymore. So any new products coming out, they, they really need to take security seriously for us. But in terms of in office, then yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know too much about that. Yeah, when, when we have our, have our town halls, like I said, it, we are quite transparent, so it's in the middle of the office. So that is a, we have a rule that every, uh, every f- uh, f- firm-wide meeting once a month, we we just not allowed anyone in the office. That that yeah. doesn't work for delivery. That includes temp- temporary staff. Actually, they can't come until until that's finished. Um, and so far, it's been working working fairly well. And again, with security for the um, the technology. Yeah, we're the, we're the same. We don't even we don't even look at it if it's not protected. To be honest. Yeah. Well, um, I'm dying to throw this catch box at somebody. So <laughs> we've got. Um, Anybody like to ask a question? You have a good opportunity here. Can I throw you this and have a... These are very good, by the way, actually. Got very effective. Off, so. Shall I... Because uh, we won't hear you otherwise. There you go. You're supposed to throw them, but I, 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 don't, I don't trust technology. Yeah, I know. You sort of got rid of the uh, point of it then, Clive. <laughs> I'm such a miserable bastard. It's not called a hand box. I know. <laughs> I know. It, it wouldn't work if I threw it anyway, so it's probably just as well. Is it on? No. Is, is it on? Ladies, gentlemen, is, is it... Uh, if, you, if you twist it and like, give oh it a tight you? twist and pull it out. No, but we're, we're recording this, you see. I need to hear your voice. Very nice, so it is, I'm sure. But, uh, we, I showed Mike those kinds yes. of boxes. I showed Mike those We like to boxes. test our technology yeah. for, before using it. We put them in know. every room, every all hands now. They got a new one out this year with uh, wireless I know. charging. Exactly. Oh. Thorough, thorough preparation planning goes into these sessions, as you know. Yeah, we could give. Could, you could give the mic. If you He's putting a couple of those little batteries in, probably. Actually. I guess working. I can hear it. It's certainly working now. We can hear grass over at 50 yards now. Yeah, so right. I was kind of hoping that uh, I'd finally catch a catch box, but everybody is giving it to me <laughs> by hand. But anyway, anyway, quick, um, uh, thank you. That was quite uh, interesting, informative. Um, what I wanted to ask from uh, the two of you, uh, and, and um, you know, basically, are there any environmental considerations to the products you choose um, in terms of, say, power, uh, power used or, um, you know, um, sort of source um, how, how the uh, you know how the equipment is sourced and, and things like that is that an active consideration for you at all or, or is that is that something that's uh, you know probably talked about more at the higher levels but just a just a quick 
question. What do you mean in terms of like, is it being more green? Um, less, m more energy efficient, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, reduce power consumption, you know, as, as things go on. I mean, things are getting more efficient. Uh, you know, your TV screens or your AV yeah, screens yeah. are getting more uh, efficient as time goes by. Your media players use less energy. But is that an active consideration uh, at all for, for you? Is so when we built our new standards, um, which are probably about two and a bit years old, um, we we did a study actually on, so when I was based in the London office, I used to walk around, I used to see all the screens on 24 seven a day. No one ever turned them off, like there'd be in live video calls or whatever. So when we did our new standards, we worked with, um, we basically put a processor in the room. And what we worked out was if we could turn all these screens off at night, um, I actually remember the study, we, we did actually did a study, we worked out we'd save about $200,000 a year in power um, based on the amount of rooms we had. So we actually have a processor in every room, and what our processor does, it looks at every bit of equipment, and it turns everything off. It, is, so it basically looks at the polycom, and it says, are you in an active call? No. It looks at the screens, are you sharing presentation? No. And if it's past a certain time at night, uh, I think it's about 9 p.m., um, we may even reduce that, but it turns everything off. And then the reason we put sensors in the room is because we actually turn everything off after every 15 minutes, even 24 hours a day. So basically, if the screens went on, no one was in the room, it turned everything off but the IR sensor is very unreliable. So we shut down many people's meetings when they were in the room and everything turned off. So we found out that quite quickly. So we adjusted that. And when we get these new sensors at some point, we'll probably go back to that. We'll probably say, now this sensor is reliable enough. No one's in the room, no one's on a call, no one's presenting, let's close everything. So we, we actively do that and that's in every single, that's in 600 rooms right now. And we're rolling out to every single one of our rooms. So we actively look at the power. When we look at products, we are looking at PoE just for ease of use for us, yep. um, rather than, you know, every time we do a new, new install, we have to do data, we have to do power, we have to do all this stuff, and it's a nightmare. Um, we have to rely on another team as well. So if we do POE, then it just goes into our network switches and everything's much easier for us. Yeah, that, so we do look at that. Yeah, quite interesting uh, for me, the POE angle, but thanks. Yeah, okay. yeah we, we also use POE. The, um, looking at the data usage and power consumption, it's not something we, we've actually looked at just yet. Um, once we have our standards down, we're still working on it, actually. I mean, we've only been in the office six months. Currently, we on the RMS, we switch everything on at 7 a.m. and switch everything off at 7 p.m. Um, in terms of screens. Uh, and if you use those, I mean, to be fair, we don't, we don't get much usage after, after 7 p.m., but that's quite interesting that you actually have a processor that, that does that, and definitely that's something delivery would want to want to look into going forward. It's going to be bigger, I'm sure, actually, more automated, isn't it, as time goes on? Oh, oh we, go, we did Hello. go throwing. Well done. Good morning. My name is Arden Kovzer, uh, Nike Operational Excellence. Gentlemen, I have a question about the link between uh, the culture in the organization, the behavior, and the technology that, that, you, that you lead. So how do you connect the two? How do you use the technology to drive uh, the, the behavior, to adjust the behavior around how people use the technology to to up the shareholder well value eventually. So, yeah, that's a good good question. Sorry. Yeah. The the culture around delivery is obviously we have a lot of millennials in employed. Uh, a very young company makes me feel. Don't know why you looked at me. <laughs> <when you said laughs> millennials. So we've just um, millennial. deployed Jamboards, uh, Google Jamboards around three of our offices now. The c the thinking behind that was gone is the days of writing on a flip chart and taking a picture and emailing that across. People want that sensation of, you know, writing on a touch screen because most people, well, anyone from the age of 18 upwards were sort of born into, you know, smartphones and touch screens. So that was, that was our main driver when we deployed the Jamboards. So now we can actually dial into meetings with a Jamboard. You can write whatever you like and our fellas in New York can, can, can see that and also collaborate and also write themselves and that was a big drive the, bi the big driver behind that was actually culture so yeah i would say cu culture is definitely something we, we do look at deliver when it comes to technology yeah yeah and that's i mean that's the same for us as well like um you know it can make it hard make our jobs much harder uh because we do have these people that want to they just want to be able to use in the office what they do at home so it makes it really hard for us you know, that's why we have literally today in the office, we have Slack, we have Teams, we have Skype for Business, we have Polycom, we have all these products. Because someone basically, because in the culture, that's the, the eBay culture, you should be able to work how you want to work. Um, which makes it 
very, very tricky when it comes to meeting rooms. It's all right on your laptop. When it comes to a meeting room, it's almost impossible to cater for all those solutions today. Um, but our culture, yeah, is just very relaxed and um, yeah, you should just be able to use what products pretty much you want to be able to use. So with, with, with our instant messaging, we also use Slack. So in our, in, a, in our minds, that replicates WhatsApp, which pretty much everyone has nowadays. Yeah. And we use uh, Workplace, which is, I don't know if anyone's used Workplace, it looks identical to Facebook. So when you're at home, you're on your Facebook, you're on WhatsApp, when you're at work, you're on Workplace and you're on, on Slack. So we are trying to replicate that, that, that user interface feeling of, of almost be, being at home and it being that simple. Um, and that was a big culture drive behind that. I think inevitably everything is going to go behavioural, but ultimately that may contrast with what the buying policy is on technology and best practice. I mean, they probably think what the company wants to supply may be different to what the behaviour is telling them. I, I, th then perhaps needs to be more of a, a close association between the two, but I think that's quite a way off, I think, really. But uh, they are doing tests and research to, to learn more how people are using products. That's exactly what Google's doing. It's entire internal... Uh, re-evaluation of, of products it moves its internal workplace around to test product and it's going to be launching a new it was bigger at, at, um, at CES this year but it's part of company policy now to actually test its working environment its products on its working environment that are intertwi intertwined first company I've seen do it actually thank you right a longer throw this time well done good throw uh, Matt, this is doing for time. You're right. specifically a question for you around the mixed collaboration environment. You mentioned Skype for Business and Polycom Proprietary in a number of different environments. Have you wrapped a strategy uh, around the workflow in which people book those meetings consistently and how that represents a meeting room environment? Are you looking at a, a plug-in within Outlook as you look to roadmap into 365 and take uh, Skype for Business and Teams into the cloud? Yeah, um, so we were, we were sort of on track, so I mentioned earlier about going to Skype for Business. Um, Polycom do, do a, um, a connector in the cloud called Real Connect, and that basically pulls your poly Polycom rooms into a Real Connect cloud, and the cloud sends you across into Skype for Business, and your calls are hosted in Microsoft Azure. Um, teams threw them a little bit. I don't think they even knew about Teams, but um, they're obviously going to look to integrate that, so that is obviously one option. Um, so for, for that, then obviously Skype for Business would be our main platform. We, we would have left Slack there. Um, we would have left the other products there. So what, what we found is when we moved, if we go sort of back in time about three years ago, we were a life-size house of ClearSea. When we moved to Polycom, the idea was to reduce Adobe Connect usage um, and, to re and to reduce all the other programs and, and to standardize on that. We never did standardize on that fully, but Polycom just naturally took off. Uh, we went from 200 concurrent calls a month. We're up to about 800 now any time. There's 800 live VC calls going on. Um, but the other products are still there. What we're doing now is our next stage, is which we're working on probably, it'll probably happen this year, is, is moving to a cloud solution and trying to integrate as much as possible into one. We're probably not going to shut down everything else. A lot of people do co cost studies and they say, well, we went to full, I don't know, say full Skype for business, we can shut down Adobe Connect. Adobe Connect costs a million dollars a month on calls. But then it's very hard to try and force all those people along. So we try not to use cost studies as much to choose a product. Um, but the idea is we will offer something that's going to be, like Polycom for us was much better than life size and ClearSea because ClearSea app wasn't very good. Obviously, they've developed on that since. The people just went to Polycom because it was so easy to use. Now, obviously, it's sort of lagging behind in the newer technology that's come out. We're hoping the next one that comes out, it will, just, it will encourage users to go to that space and use it more. And then the, ideally, the usage on the other products will start to, to start to intertwine. Just stuff like every time you get a laptop now, Polycom's installed on it. You know, so everyone sees the app there, and they just use it more. We don't install, we don't sort of force the other ones. Um, for our company, like the developers, they love Slack. If we told them they had to use Teams, it would be uproar. So, like people say, they have their own room. Like we do, sort of make sure the developers are very, very happy. So I don't think we'd probably be able to get rid of a lot of those products. Um, but we are trying to consolidate as much as possible. But yeah, everything will probably sort of sit there in the background, sadly. One quick one off the back of that. Do you have a voice strategy that you're looking at as part of this? And are you looking to stack that up within the video and collab environment? Or is it something you're running parallel? 
So we're, we're moving towards uh, not installing any phones anymore on people's desks. So no one gets a phone on their desk anymore. They used to. Um, again, there's sort of there's early stages, various RFPs and stuff are in, are in flow, um, which is sort of like sort of confidential. But um, we, we are moving to a strategy where there'll be no phones anymore apart from our CS. We have a massive CS center in Salt Lake. They have to have phones. Obviously, if that goes down, we'd, we'd be screwed until it's reliable enough. Um, you know, so yeah, basically everyday office people that join the company, they don't get a phone anymore, don't get a desk phone. They, they use Skype for business for all their phone calls, which may become Teams. Um, that may, depending where we go on the VC route, that could change towards that product or it could stay towards Skype. But yeah, our, our voice strategy is um, we're going to route most of our calls out to, out to Azure. So, yeah. Just off of that, Matt, do you provide uh, work mobile devices? Uh, we do, yeah. Yeah. Everyone gets everyone gets an iPhone or an Android or, or whatever it is on that. Um, we just don't need. I've not had a phone on my desk for five five years, six years. Um, last night I actually had a Sev call when I had eight Skype for Business calls at two in the morning when our servers went down, which is a bit annoying. But because I'm here, obviously it's linked in, so wherever I am in the world, it just rings my phone, which is very handy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I think we've run out of time, actually. Sadly, I can't believe that's an hour gone. There you go. Well, thank you very much. That was useful for you. Thanks to Martin Nehan. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Clive. Cheers, Clive. Thank Thanks, everyone.